Welcome to Transformational Pathways, a podcast created by Toastmasters District 46 in the greater New York area, where we share conversations from influencers within the Toastmasters community and people whose lives have positively transformed by walking down the Toastmasters path. Whether you're just getting started in your career, have had recent career changes, or you're navigating different languages, we're here to help you build confidence by discovering new tools, overcoming your fears to find your voice, and engaging in a thriving community. Enjoy today's episode. Hello! Welcome to another episode of Toastmasters District 46 Transformational Pathways Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Mason, and walking the pathway with us today is our guest, Evelyn Marrero. Evelyn, you are a white-collar crime investigator for one of the top prosecutor's offices in the United States, the Office of the New York County District Attorney. You focus on money laundering and tax crimes. You have been a Toastmaster for years, and as of the date of this recording, you're the club growth director of all of District 46. But... You are about to become the program quality director for the entire district, leaving the old job behind. Congrats, Evelyn, and welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Scott. I am so excited to be here with you. You are such a wonderful host. I've been keeping up with all of your podcasts, and they have been just amazing. And yes, I am currently the club growth director. And I will be, beginning July 1st, the District 46 Program Quality Director. Very scary. But I'm hoping to bring a lot of great things to the district in terms of training and quality for the members and for the clubs. So I'm really looking forward to my role and I'm really excited about just encountering everyone and just delving right in. And of course, I'm going to need a lot of help. So all of you out there watching that know you have something to offer the district, reach out to me. And Evelyn, I know you're going to make it fun. I have to say part of the part of what makes being the host of this particular podcast so wonderful is that with Toastmasters, you have such a diversity of people who know how to talk. And so they're coming in here and they're bringing their full selves and making it interesting. Y'all make it easy for me. And I am going to start by making you interesting to everyone, although just the minute you open your mouth, you're interesting. So so we'll just amp it up a notch. <laughs> Evelyn, Thank you. am I sensing maybe a little bit of a New York accent that you got there? Absolutely. I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. I've been here all of my life. I'm still in Brooklyn. I did a little stint for about a couple of months in the Bronx and a little stint for about a year or so in Queens. But Brooklyn has my heart and always will have my heart. I'm a Brooklynite through and through. You are a true homegirl then. I'm down with that. (laughs) Tell me, what was it like growing up here in New York when you were a little girl? As a little girl... I really enjoyed growing up in Brooklyn. I grew up in Brownsville and Brownsville, Brooklyn is sort of like, or was considered, although at the time I didn't know it was considered sort of like a slum ghetto, if you will. And I grew up in the projects. I lived in the projects with my family, but there was such a sense of community within the projects. You knew your neighbors because you couldn't help, but know your neighbors. Mm -hmm. You were all on top of each other pretty Mm -hmm. much. Mm -hmm. So you knew your neighbors. We grew up, playing with each other, supporting each other, being with each other, just being really a community. And it didn't matter, at least not then. Nothing mattered as far as your background, where you were from, what your skin color was, what your hair shape was, if you were skinny, fat, whatever. We were just all kids having just a really great time growing up and enjoying being alive. And it was just so different because back then you didn't have all of these electronics. So being a kid meant you were out there playing punch ball, 
basketball, baseball, tag, hot piece and butter, you know, all of those games that little kids play to entertain themselves when, you know, the parents throw them outside because they want to clean or cook or they want to break from the kids, you know? <laughs> now, Evelyn, just answer this one question for me because everyone is dying to know, were you bashful? No. I wasn't. I was never bashful. <laughs> I was never bashful. I was actually, well, here's the thing, Scott. I'm the youngest of four siblings. I have two younger siblings that came way after. Uh, my father remarried and we, I have two uh, stepsister, a stepsister and a stepbrother who are much younger than me. But in my household growing up, there were four of us and I was the youngest. And so if you wanted to be heard, if you wanted something, if you needed something, you couldn't be bashful. You couldn't be shy because you would just get thrown under the seat, you know, <laughs> under the bus, as they say. So, no, you had to be you had to be assertive. <laughs> and I did learn how to be assertive very, very young in life. And I've never been afraid of speaking. I've spoken in my profession as an investigator, as you mentioned before. I've spoken in open court. I've spoken in grand jury. I've made presentations. I have also even been on TV when I've had to make announcements about certain things at certain times in my career. But I've also, in my community, I've also been a choir member of my church, and I also was a lector in my church. So that entails going in front of an altar, proclaiming the word of the Lord, and or reading messages that need to be read from the podium to thousands of people in the pod in, in, in pews that some of them you may know and some of them you may not know. Some of them are from the community and some of them are just visiting. So I've never been afraid to speak. My whole reason for joining Toastmasters was the desire to become more concise when I speak because I tend to be very detailed. I want to give you so much information. I want to share so much of my knowledge mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because I feel it's important to share what you know, that you shouldn't think, keep it to yourself. Yeah, I think that that's actually a really important part of your Toastmaster story that you just shared because the stereotype of the person who is a prospective Toastmaster member is of someone who's afraid to speak or who doesn't even know English. But you were raised in New York City, so you know English. And obviously, if you were the youngest of four kids, you needed to learn, and you were, you needed to be assertive and you were reading announcements and singing in front of a massive church. As you just said, you weren't shy. What do you think is the basis of this myth? That Toastmasters is only for those who are who are afraid to speak. And by the way, it does help those who are afraid to speak. But it's not like that's the whole story. I'm never uh, absolutely. Either, by the way, it, Scott, it's not a myth. I would say that I am not the majority. I am more a minority. Mm -hmm. There are tons of people that thousands upon hundreds of thousands of individuals who are fearful of going in front of others and speaking. Mostly because of their confidence. They're not confident. They may know their content, but they're not confident. They feel they're going to be ridiculed. They feel they're going to be laughed at. They feel that somehow whatever they say is not going to be said properly. And they're going to be, I don't know, stoned, if you will, in the olden mm -hmm. days, maybe. So there is a real fear. And I would say maybe 85%, if not more of the population has that fear. So it is a real fear. And that's where Toastmasters program comes in perfectly because you're in a supportive environment where you are encouraged, you are practicing, you get to gain confidence, you get to learn different techniques to help you become a better speaker, a better presenter. And as a Toastmaster that I know for a very long time always says to me, Toastmasters is where you fail. You're allowed to fail in the club, in the Toastmaster club, because that's how you learn. By failing, you learn. It's better to fail there than to go into a boardroom when you're supposed to do a presentation at your job and for the first time 
do something you've never done before and fail at that point. Better to well, fail in I the will, club. Totally. And I will testify about that, if I may. I have failed a lot of times in my club. Thank God that the atmosphere there is supportive enough that I am allowed to do it. That being said, with Toastmasters having a membership that has a significant portion of it, of people who are afraid of speaking, it's one thing for you to join it because you need to be more concise, but why would anyone then, why would anyone say to you Toastmasters is what you need? Is there a story behind that? How did you end up walking into your first Toastmasters meeting? Oh, I was, com that, that is a very interesting story, Scott. I belong to an association, the New York City Managerial Association, and we had a member of the association that was a Toastmaster. She belonged to the Blue and Green Toastmasters, and she presented the idea of a Toastmasters club to the board of the association, and they agreed to give it a try. So they sent out information to the members and said, if anyone's interested, and of course, I was like, sure, why not? You know, let me go see what this is all about. Cause I've always had curiosity. So I'm, why not? Let me go check this out. We were about 25 in the room, including the Toastmasters. In addition to the Toastmasters that gave a demo meeting, mm -hmm. there are 25 association members present. This young man who I can't remember his name and I don't even remember the, the title of his speech, but you know, that saying about, you may not remember how I, what I said, but you'll remember how you felt. That's yeah. exactly how I felt. This young man gave a speech about bubble gum and what? all 25 of us were in complete <laughs> awe. We were amazed because he made it so interesting. He made it so easy. He made the topic of bubblegum seem like he was talking about outer space. Like he was talking wow. about Wall Street. Like it was just an amazing speech. And all of us immediately, immediately after that demo meeting, all lined up by the table to sign up. And we all became charter members that same night. It was that fantastic. And I said to myself, if someone can give a speech about bubblegum and totally awe 25 individuals, 25 strangers, if you will, mm -hmm. I want to be that kind of a speaker. Did he convert you into a gum smacker? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to answer that, but let, I, you do have to answer this. How did that end up tying into this issue of lack of concision on your part? Well, as I joined Toastmasters, I found that the educational program had a lot of different aspects. It's not just about getting in front of a podium or getting in front of a classroom or getting in front of a stage or getting on a stage in front of a group of people and speaking. It's more about learning the techniques, learning how to be concise, learning how to get your message clear and across. And all of those things were things that I needed to learn as a speaker, because as I said, I spoke all the time, but I wasn't concise and I wasn't getting my message across in a way that compelled people to action, that compelled people to say, mm. hey, I like that idea. Or you know what, what she's saying makes sense. Instead, because I wasn't concise, I was boring people. People were kind of zoning me out. So this is something that I learned, but here's the interesting thing, Scott. In addition to learning how to be a better communicator, I found the leader in me. I had no idea that there was even a leader inside of me. And lo and behold, here I am. I was area director. I, my area was President's Distinguished. I was office. I held every office in my club. I've had, I've done three conferences. I've been chairs of three different conferences, two leadership conference and the regular spring conference. I have done TLI. I've done registration. I was now, I am club growth director and soon to be program quality director. So I have truly 
taken myself out of my so-called comfort zone and moved into an area that I had no idea even existed. And lo and behold, here I am. And all I've got to say to that is boom. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes, but let's roll back and talk a little bit more about the lack of concisiveness and your early days in Toastmasters. Because I bet you there are going to be folks who might be thinking about Toastmasters, who are listening to this or watching it, and try to decide if it's right for them based on your story. Let's talk a little bit about the emotional journey that you were on. Was it hard for you to face the fact or admit that you had an issue with concisiveness. And talk to us a little bit about that journey into moving from that recognition, if you had it, into action through Toastmasters. Absolutely. So my son actually is the one that sort of smacked me in the face with it. Because whenever I would speak to him, and he's he's now 34 years old, but then he was younger. And whenever I would try to speak with him about any issues, he would say, mom, can you just get to the point? And then there were times when I would be with friends and we would be, you know, hanging out, whatever. And all of a sudden, one of them would say, so what's the point? Because I would just give too much detail. I needed, I just... And the part of it is because I love to write. And when you write, you have to write in such a way that you paint a picture. So when I speak, I wanted to paint a picture. But you don't need to paint a picture when you're speaking. You need to just be concise and give the information and do it in a manner that is direct and effective and efficient. And that's where Toastmasters came in. I started giving speeches in my club. Right from we, at that time we were in the legacy program. We were using the manuals. It wasn't digital yet. And I started right away with the CC manual and I would get feedback and I would get tips and I would get advice. And I had a mentor that would work with me and say, well, try this and try that. And how about doing this? And I went to the Toastmasters International Convention that year in Orlando, Florida. And I met so many amazing people and I felt like, wow, this is a whole Toastmaster community. I felt like family, Scott. I really, truly felt like family at that convention. People were friendly. People were willing to come up to you. The presenters not only gave you their advice and their feedback, but they also, till this day, I still keep in touch with some of those presenters because they gave you their personal information, their communication. They said, reach out to me, talk to me. And till this day, I'm still on their mailing list. I still get messages from them. And it's just amazing. That's, yeah, that is a part of Toastmasters that I don't think people truly appreciate from the outside. And when they join, they experience the power of. And that is community. We live in a world where institutional ties are increasingly fractured. And what that does, in my opinion, is create a sense of instability. But outside of our families, we all need a place to call home. And I don't know if you've experienced it this way, but you're definitely describing it this way as of Toastmasters clubs, and even the international conventions, which, by the way, I went to one in 2019 and can vouch for that exact same thing. I had the exact same experience, and I'm still in touch with the strangers that I met there to this day. A sense of community, of people that are like-minded. How have you experienced that, and has that been anything that's been transformational for you? Absolutely, well? absolutely. Let me give you an example. When In my career, I've been to 20 million trainings, if not more. And you go to the trainings, the trainee, you know, gives you whatever he could be a great or she could be a great presenter and they could give you the most wonderful training in the world. But at the end of the day, they leave, they go on their merry way. You never see them again. You never hear from them. You don't know anything about them. They're just, you know, they were there that day. They did what they needed to do and they're gone. With Toastmasters International, the presenters that come to the conferences, to the conventions, to the seminars, to the anything that we even put in on the district. These individuals 
are committed to helping the Toastmaster member. They're committed to being by your side and giving you whatever support you need, Mm. because that's what Toastmasters is about, a supportive environment. And they, right away, they connect with you. And that connection is important because when you feel like your family, when you feel that people care, that your journey matters to someone else besides just yourself, that sense of, wow, I'm important. I matter. That's a sense that you get when you're a Toastmaster. And that's that's a feeling that is amazing to help you to progress and to grow and to learn. And hopefully you turn around and grab somebody else and help them and mentor them and show them. Toastmasters has always been this wonderful organization where those that have made it and that have progressed in it will allow others to stand on their shoulders to reach higher heights. And that's the amazing thing about Toastmasters. You don't find that in corporate America. You don't find that in any corporate environment because most corporate environments are, you know, everybody's out for themselves and they all want to be top dog, top banana, whatever. But not in Toastmasters. In Toastmasters, we're all there to say, hey, I'll give you a hand. And if you want to stand on my shoulders and go higher than me, by all means, go for it. That's genuinely moving. The ability to create community. You mentioned earlier that you found the leader within you. Do you feel that there's a connection between building community and becoming Absolutely. A Absolutely. When you feel supported and you feel people are recognizing things that you do that you may not even recognize yourself. And you have someone come up to you and say something you said or did made a difference in their life. That's a really good feeling. And that makes you want to be better, want to do more. And want to lead. And that's that whole sense of community, that whole sense of togetherness, and that it's sort of like a camaraderie, if you will. It's it's amazing. And I tell you, Scott, that this year, because of our pandemic, that has been so much more important than other years. Because when we have members that have been isolated, that When everything shut down, they lived alone, had no one, had nowhere to go. And being able to transition to a Zoom meeting and see a bunch of faces, even if it was in the little Brady squares, as they like to call them, it's okay because at least you connected. You saw someone for whatever time that was on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, you had a real connection with people that... A, we're in the same situation and B, we're there to promote you, to help you, to assist you, to give you guidance if need be, and to support you and to tell you it's going to be okay and we're going to get through this. So that was really important this year. Evelyn, you were an outspoken young girl from your earliest days, but you said a few minutes ago you never knew you had a leader inside of you. Talk to us about why you might not have seen that leader inside of you as a child. I was always somebody that was behind the scenes. I didn't like, I, maybe it was my upbringing, my culture, where, and maybe being a woman, where you're supposed to be seen, not heard. So mm. it was more of, I would do things behind the scene. I would help behind the scene. I would take care of things behind the scene. But the front person was always someone else. The one who, mm-hmm. and, and I had absolutely no problem with someone taking the credit for anything I did. It didn't bother me whatsoever. I knew I did it. If someone else wanted the credit, that's okay. It didn't bother me. Mm-hmm. 
But at some point, you get to the point where you say, you know, maybe if I'm able and capable of doing all these things, maybe I should step up and do them because maybe I have more to offer in the front line than being behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And that's Mm -hmm. where Toastmasters helped me to discover the leader inside of me. When I realized that I was making a difference in other people's lives, when I realized that people were coming up to me and saying, thank you for doing this or saying that. Was there a moment that clicked or was it a gradual evolution? It was a gradual evolution. For me, it was a gradual evolution. It was something that little by little, and I tell you, it it took a lot of encouraging too. It took other people saying to me, I think you can do this and just literally giving me the task to do it, just putting it in my, in my lap and saying, go run with it. And I would say, Oh, okay. And I would run with it. Um, I got to tell you that when I became area director, I didn't necessarily get much training. Uh, I'm not sure why, uh, couldn't really answer that. It's been quite some time, but I, I read the manual. I knew what I needed to do. I knew what was expected of me and I ran with it. And my district, my area became president's distinguished. So for those who might be listening, who are not Toastmasters, what is an area director and what is president's distinguished? Okay. We are all the clubs. So each club, there are about approximately four clubs that belong to an area. And an area director is sort of the liaison between the clubs and the club members and the district. Anything that the club needs, that the club wants to do, that there is a desire for, and it could be on the member level or the club level, the officers, whatever it is. I am, as area director, I would be the liaison to make sure that whatever services they needed in order for the club to have club excellence, that I would be able to provide it or that I would somehow facilitate it for the club. And that's what an area director does. Now, each club has what they call a a goal. They have 10 goals. It's called the Distinguished Club Program. And what that means is if your members are enjoying their club and they're following the Toastmaster program, then they're achieving. And if they're achieving then your club is completing the district, the uh, distinguished club program. The first six goals of the distinguished club program is basically educational goals. So if your members are learning and they're getting educational goals, then your club is getting those credits. If you're if your club is an exciting club where they're in, you're inviting other members and it's growing and you're gaining members, you're also getting credit. If your club officers are diligent about doing their job in collecting dues to turn in, to turn over to Toastmasters International, which by the way is nominal compared to other similar programs and is also diligent about putting in their officer list, then you also get credit for that. And at the end of the day, you get anywhere from five to 10 credits. That means that you're either distinguished, select distinguished, or president's distinguished. Now, in the same manner, the area also, it's sort of like an accountability. It's to show that I'm doing my job or my role. So if I'm able to make sure that my clubs are achieving then I also get credit. And when I get credit, it it falls in the same scenario. It's either distinguished, select distinguished, or president's distinguished. And I succeeded in getting all of my clubs to achieve. And as as a result, I became president's distinguished area. If I am a young person thinking about joining Toastmasters and I hear all of that, What relevance does that have to me as someone who might want to be developing as a speaker or as a leader? If you're in a club that 
is succeeding, that the members are participating, where you're having meetings, where there are speeches, there are evaluations, there are table topics, which is impromptu speaking for those of you who are not Toastmasters and don't know what table topics is, then your club is a vibrant club where members are learning, are excelling, are progressing. The educational program is working. Remember that Toastmasters International is an educational program. So like anything else, if you are following the program, if you're going forward in the program, if you're sticking to it, you're progressing, you're learning, that then translates into the club getting credit for you success, for you succeeding, for you being successful. So you want to be in a club that has success and you want to make sure that your club is successful because that's accountability that the club is doing what they're supposed to do, that the members are doing what they're supposed to do. And if it's not happening, that's where the district leaders should get involved to help the club to be a better club, to make sure that the member, because everything is about the member. Toastmasters International is an inverted triangle. The members are at the top. The leaders are mm. at the bottom. We support mm. the club members. It's all about supporting the club members throughout the entire program. Everything we do is so that the members can succeed can get what they came to Toastmasters for, which is the educational program in communication and leadership. What is the hardest thing about being a leader? The hardest thing about being a leader is trusting your own instincts. When you delegate a task to someone, you delegate it because you trust that that person can do the job, whatever the task may be. And the hardest part, sometimes it's being able to follow through with yourself and say, yes, I know this person can do it. I have faith that this person can do it. I delegated it to this person or for that matter to this group because I gave them the tools necessary for them to succeed and they're going to. And so it might sort of, you know, and, and you might laugh at this, it might sort of be a bit like you're a nervous ninny or a nervous nanny where <laughs> ninny or nanny where you're worried about that. Will it happen? Will it happen? Will it out? You know, and that's the hard part about being a leader where you have expectations. You have people expecting things from you to be delivered. So when you assign things or you ask people to do or groups to do things, you're expecting whatever it is that you ask them to do to be done within a, in a timely fashion and to somewhat your expectation, because if they fail, you fail. And if you fail, then those that are waiting for you to deliver will also be deceived. So that I think is, is the hardest part of being a leader. And finding people that want to step up and lead because lots of people have it in them to lead. And maybe like me, they need that encouragement. Like I need it way back when, mm -hmm. when I needed someone to come up to me and say, sure, you can do this. You got this. Mm -hmm. So I try to do that. When I speak to people, I try to let them know that you got this, you have what it takes. And if you have any questions, I'm here for you. Uh, I'm not going to abandon you, give you something to do, and then just abandon you. You have the support of the whole Toastmaster community. So feel free to just, if you, in, when in doubt, ask. And I know that that's hard for many people because they, they feel that by asking, they're showing their weakness that they don't know. Yeah. But it's important to realize that as individuals, there are things that we know. There are things that, we know we don't know. And then there's this whole vast world of things that we have no clue that we don't know that even exist. And so there's never a stupid question. Ask. 
You'd be surprised all the information you get by just asking and how clarity will make you a better leader. What makes a program in Toastmasters one that is high quality? A program that gives you the tools, the competencies that you are seeking, whether it's to be a better communicator, whether it's to be a better leader, whether it's certain aspects that you're learning that you want to learn, such as creating a podcast like we're doing here, or perhaps doing a PowerPoint presentation in the boardroom, or maybe you want to learn different languages because you need to communicate with customers that have different backgrounds. Maybe you need to learn different customs and you can do that because we're such a diverse organization in 145 countries mm -hmm. that you're going to find someone somewhere that speaks whatever language and has whatever mm -hmm. customs you are seeking information on. There's no doubt in my mind there's someone out there to help you. And the good thing about Toastmasters is, as a Toastmaster family, we're all here to help each other. Mm -hmm. At the drop of a hat, any one of us will respond, will answer, will email, will uh, however you want to do it. Text, talk, Instagram, doesn't matter. Do you feel a lot of pressure at the high level of Toastmasters that you're at? How do you deal with it if you do? The pressure comes from, I think, just wanting to do the best for everyone, for your members, wanting to put out the best program. So with quality, with program quality director, I'm going to be in charge. My role entails handling all of the educational programs for the district. That's huge. We're talking about a hundred and some odd clubs that I need to somehow make sure that their educational program is on track, that whatever resources they need, they're getting, that I am providing training for not only the officers of the clubs, but also for the area directors and the division directors. In addition to providing some quality content, such as seminars, this, uh, leadership uh, training, uh, leadership conference, the spring conference. So there's a lot that goes on sort of behind the scenes, if you will. And it's important to make sure that whatever I am going to put out there, has relevance. And in this ever-changing world, being relevant is tough because what was relevant yesterday, people could care less about today. So that's, that's where the pressure comes in and that's where the challenges come in. But I think I'm up for it. I think I'm ready for it. What was your very first Toastmaster speech about? Well, the icebreaker speech. Yes. Of course, everyone starts with an icebreaker speech. And my icebreaker speech, I spoke about how I got involved in law enforcement from watching Perry Mason as a child. I loved Perry Mason because Perry Mason won every case. <laughs> and so I wanted to be a lawyer and I wanted to win every case because that's what was being portrayed on the TV. Here was this lawyer that no matter the odds, he always came on top. And I was like, wow, that's what I want to do. I want to be a lawyer and I want to win every case. I didn't become a lawyer. I didn't win every case, but. That's how, that was my first speech, how I got involved in law enforcement to begin with. And it's been a great career. I've loved it. I'm actually almost at the tail end of it. I will be retiring in another year or so. And it's been wonderful. It's been great. And then I'm going to start the next chapter of my life. But I will always be a Toastmaster. Love it. What 
is the most inspiring Toastmasters story you can think of? The most inspiring Toastmasters story. Well, you got to give me a little bit more than that, meaning a story that I've said or that I've heard. Maybe or Maybe a member story or someone that you've known in Toastmasters who's changed and really it's, it's just lit up your day. Well, I've seen a lot of changes in, in many members. I've seen them grow from coming in and sitting in the back of the room like we all do, right? We sit in the back of the room. We don't want to be known. We don't want to be recognized. And then ending up on the international stage giving a speech. Mm. So I will tell you this inspirational story. Our district director, Patricia Kid Wingira, mm -hmm. I met her at the, when I was area direct, area governor, we were called area governors then, when I was area governor and was holding, hosting my first area contest. And she spoke and she amazed me the way she was so gracious. She was so well-spoken. She gave such a wonderful speech about her home country. And it was so moving and inspiring. And I said to myself, then this Toastmaster is going places. Wow. Little did I know that we would become good friends. And here she is, the district director, and I'm the club growth director. So and it's been a, it's been a wonderful journey with her. It really has to just watch her grow and become the leader that she is today. And, and you all are both guests on this podcast. Ah, there you go. <laughs> Some things we never leave behind. Evelyn, who is your favorite leader? Who is your favorite speaker and why? Oh, okay. So my favorite leader, I have, I don't have any favorite leader per se. I admire many different people for many different things. I do have favorite speakers that I listen to. There are a bunch of them also. Uh, I listen to Lance Miller. I love the way he speaks. I'm actually on his mailing list and I get emails from him with tips on a daily basis. Mm. Mark Williams, who is a member of District 119, he made it all the way to the international stage as a contestant. Mm. Didn't quite make it mm -hmm. with the, but he did win the finalist. He always amazes me the way he speaks and with his uh, knowledge of so many things. And we're also great friends. Ted Tate, um, and I think I'm getting the wrong, the name wrong. He's a great speaker as well. Uh, there are so many. Mark Brown, who actually spoke uh, in our district recently, he came from our district and was an international winner. International mm -hmm. World Championship. So there are many speakers that I admire. Outside of the Toastmaster world, I don't necessarily have any one person that I say is my favorite, but I do like certain, I do like Barack Obama. I like Michelle Obama. I like what they say. I like their message. I like the way they speak. Um, over the years, I have liked, I like the Pope. I like what he has to say on occasions. So there is, it all depends on, I don't have a favorite. I just have favorite things that people say. Because there are times when I don't agree with what some people say. And there are times where what they're saying doesn't, coincide with my way of thinking or with my ethical or moral fabric, if you will. So I don't have favorites in that sense. What I have are, as I said, there are favorite times when people say things and I'm like, wow, okay, that was good. You know, and that's pretty much it. I'm, I like to think of myself as just enjoying a lot of different 
people for different reasons. Which is very true to the Toastmaster spirit, is it not? It is indeed. And I have 135 countries to go around and meet and greet. Uh, That's a lot of work. (laughs) (laughs) Evelyn, it has been great having you on the show today. Thank you for joining us and and sharing your story. Are you you kidding? It's a pleasure. For those of you listening or watching, if you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe and, and leave a review or a comment. Also, don't forget to follow District 46 on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. If you're new to Toastmasters, check out Toastmasters46.org. That's Toastmasters46.org to learn more about us or visit one of our clubs. Toastmasters is where leaders are made. Thank you so much, Scott. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us on Transformational Pathways. If you enjoyed today's episode or got anything out of it, please rate, review, and subscribe. And if you're interested in learning more about Toastmasters District 46, check out the link in the show notes below.